Uh, welcome to Christian Bible Chapel. We're here for our evening service. And we're in the book of Acts, chapter 16. We're dealing with missions. The mission of the church. What is the mission of the church? Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessedness of your word of God. We thank you for, uh, for the extraordinary word that you have allowed to be handed even down to us. We realize that the Christians of the early church did not have all the epistles in their possessions as well as the Old Testament. But that which they had, they used and they felt confident in it and they believed in it and they preached it. Would to God that the church today will respond the same way in believing what the scripture says, preaching exactly what the scriptures says, carrying out its mission to take the gospel to the ends of the world, that many may respond to the gospel through the calling of the Holy Spirit, that through repentance and faith in you they might be saved. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what is the mission of the church? As we saw, as we began the book of Acts here, we start looking at the, the mission of the church is to preach the gospel. And as we travel through, and I'm flipping the page, I don't see or I cannot recognize the familiarity of the word of God in the book of Acts that there is a ministry of healing, a ministry of prophesying, a ministry of what? tent meetings for healing services, snakes, casting out demons, exorcisms. I don't see it. I, 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 really, I really don't see it. I don't see the prosperity-ness of the church, the, 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 the grandeur of the glitter and all the excitement and showboating. I do not see it. I do not see the church in the early days. I'm flipping the pages wherein people would stand up in the congregation and start giving wild predicaments and I, 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 I all what is 24, 27 chapters here. I, I really, Luke must have missed something. I mean, the, the, the writer of the gospel of, Act, of the book of Acts, Luke, he, 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 he must have left something. He must have left out um, all these things I just mentioned because I don't see it. All I see is the preaching of the gospel, the suffering of the saints. The, the saints are in such a physical poor state, but they are still rejoicing and preaching the gospel. I, I see every now and then someone is cured from a demon. Uh, people who were not saved come into Christ, but nowhere do I see what's What's happening in Nigeria, Ghana, Togo, Los Angeles, Chicago, Mississippi, Alabama, Quebec. And I, I don't see all that which is happening around the globe today in this 21st century. I, I, I don't see all that glitter, all that prosperity, all that showboating and trips to Israel to gloat over the tomb of Jesus. I, I, I really don't see that where the Christians went to Jerusalem to look at the burial spot of Jesus. I don't see where they, they did all this money spending, prosperity and rich, I don't see it, but, but yet we have it today. You know why? Because we have lost, the church has lost its goal, it has lost its mission. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door now. And the reason why he's not at the church, because the church has kicked Jesus out. They have literally pushed them out. The seven churches that John came back and wrote in the book of Revelations, we see the devastation of many of the churches. I'm, I'm turning there, Revelations chapter 2 how that they 
some just turned their backs on Jesus. And what you see happen uh, periodically throughout the church, it's, it's, it, it looks like all the churches in chapter 7, chapter 2 and, and 3 of Revelation is bombarded in our society, in our 21st century. We are plagued with all of this. We are we're plagued with laziness. We are plagued with ignorance of scriptures. We are plagued with the, the teachings of Satan and secretness and mysticism and yoga in the church. We are plagued with deadism. The church is dead. The, the, the church is worldly, Pergamon, they just just ignoring the gospel, the true gospel. They're preaching the gospel, but it's not the true gospel. It's another gospel. They love the teachings of Balak, of the Nicolaitans. They, they love the teachings of worshiping idols, Tartira. They, they sacrifice to idols. They it's amazing. The church is really, really. Jesus said, I wish you was lukewarm. I wish you was really hot, but you're cold and you're, I'm just spewing you out of my mouth, Jesus said to the church of Laodicea. Let's turn our attention to Luke chapter, I mean Acts chapter 16. Once again, the Apostle Paul is under scrutiny, persecution, and suffering, and persecution, scrutiny, and suffering is not named among the Christian churches today. It's glory, it's lights, it's fame and fortune, power, prosperity. That's what's dominating the scene in the churches today. Why? Because many local churches, many churches, has lost this calling the true calling, the mission to evangelize, to disciple the church. Acts chapter 16, the crowd joined at joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrate ordered them to be stripped and beaten. In other words, their clothes was literally torn from their backs, ripped up, and they was beaten. It was flogged. And then thrown into the prison. I don't know if this was the Maritime prison where the most famous of all notorious prisoners would put. But it wasn't an ordinary uh, prison. Uh, but in, in any case, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them. They had their own personal guard standing with them, chained to the wall, chained to the guards. And when the prison, the guard, the, the head guard, the jailer, he's the head guy in the prison. And he received orders from the magistrates to put them in the inner cell, fasten their feet in the stocks. I mean, can you imagine whether they were sitting or standing, their hands were shackled to the wall, their feet were shackled to the wall, guards was on the left and the right, and these were strong, disciplined guards. Plus the jailer did his rounds moment by moment to make sure everything was secured. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns. Even in the situation that they were going through, the men of God were singing and praising God, singing hymns to God. The other prisoners were listening to them, the scripture says. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake that shook the foundation of the prison, and at once all the prison doors were flew open, and everyone's chains, the chain on their wrist, the chain on their hand, the chain most on their on their waist. They had, they they were secured now. They wasn't going nowhere. It came loose. All this commotion and noise and earthquake woke up the jailer. He was sleeping on the job. And you know that you lose your job if you was 
was a guard at Jesse Patuxent or any prison. And today, you, you, you know, you was commanded to stay awake, awoke for those hours that you were to guard the prisoners. The jailer, the head jailer, fell awoke, fell asleep. But he woke up when all this commotion, and when he saw the prisoners' doors open, he knew that he not only he was going to lose his job, he was going to lose his life. So instead of them embarrassing him, confiscating his home, putting his family in prison, he decided to do one ultimate thing. He was going to take his life. So he drew his sword and is about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul saw this. Paul, the Apostle Paul saw this, and he shouted out, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. We are all here. That, that reminds me back in chapter 4. You remember in chapter 4, Herod locked uh, Peter up, and after he killed James, he killed James. Right? And when it pleased the people, when it pleased the people, he, he caught and incarcerated uh, Peter. And he was going to display Peter as the master leader of the uh, Christian people at that time. And he felt that he had a prize because he seized Peter and John and he, he got the number one man, Peter. But Peter, through the angel of the Lord, came in and unshackled Peter and John from the chain and let them go. Now, we have the same situation here. Paul says, don't do yourself no harm. The jailer called for the lights and rushed them and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Now, why did this jailer come running to Paul and Silas, kneeling down, falling, but trembling, scared, terrified? Because he heard the gospel message. Many of the prisoners heard the gospel message. They heard the singing. They heard the praying. They were witnessing by Paul, Paul and Silas. Even in the midst of their beaten back, bloody back, against the wall. Pain, coldness, hunger. Shackled to the wall with chains. These prisoners and guards and the chief jailer, the chief guard, this man came and trembled and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Wouldn't it, it, it would be nice if people were to come and do that? But you know what? Ordinarily, they're not going to do that. Ordinarily, people are not just going to say those words. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit of God. But you see, the Holy Spirit of God works along with the true gospel. This provokes a person to cry out, what must I do to be saved? What had happened was the Holy Spirit of God was moving upon the heart of this jailer through by him listening to the songs, hearing the gospel message, the words that Paul and Silas were telling the people, the jailer heard this. Now, this was at midnight. Now, remember, early in the day, they was in the marketplace preaching the gospel, and some girl was following them, possessed by a demon. And she was shouting to the, to the people in the marketplace, these men are the servants of the Most High God. True, Paul and Silas were. But what was happening is that the demons were using this girl, and this girl was throwing not so much attention to the Most High God, whom we know is Jesus Christ, but she was saying that, I'm telling truth. Listen to me. See how false prophets, false ministries are doing the same thing? They use the name of Jesus. They quote the Bible. They read the Bible. They say the name of Jesus. They say the name of God. They got their own crinklets and, and all this in their church, in their ministry, in their tents, 
in their building, in their places, and yet these men are false, just like this girl. Paul turned around and said to the girl, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you, come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the girl realize that they have lost money by means of making it through this female slave who had a spirit in her, who predicted the future. So you see where what the scriptures is talking about. We got people in church people in houses, people in huts, and places of business who predict the future, who preach the gospel, who talk about Christ, who talk about God, read your palm, read tea leaves, read the cards, all this, and people are believing in it. And especially when they say, yeah, um, the, the, the scriptures is the word of God. The scriptures is this. The Bible is this. Jesus is this. And they do not really mean it. This girl didn't really mean what she was saying. She was drawing attention to Satan and the other gospel, which is not another gospel. So, after being beaten and flogged and everything, the jailer from that hour all the way up to midnight was listening to the apostles preaching, witnessing, and singing. At midnight, by that time, the jailer was asleep. And most likely, if the head jailer was asleep, the rest of the guys were taking a nod. But in any case, Luke sought to aim his message towards the jailer. The jailer called for the lights. This aroused the other guards to wake up and bring lights. See, at this time, the lights were dimmed because it was nighttime, it's time to go to sleep. He called for the lights. He came trembling. He expressed the need for true salvation. Sir, what must I do to be saved? What does it mean to be saved? He wanted to be introduced and also to receive the Messiah, Jesus Christ, as Savior. He wanted the forgiveness of sins. He wanted to be forgiven of his sins. He wanted all of this, and he recognized his need. This was the power of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit works along with the gospel message. Not with all these so-called services that's going on, prophetic services, calling out services, healing services, casting out demons, snake bitten and this poisons and whatever, and all the showboating that is going on in a lot of churches. No, the Holy Spirit works with the gospel, the preached word of God. A person cannot be truly saved apart from the preaching, the proclamation of the gospel. And that's the mission of the church, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? It is the good news. It is good tidings that Jesus Christ, Son of God, came into the world to suffer and die for sin and that upon believing that he died and buried and rose again, you can have the forgiveness of sin through your confession of your faith, repentance of your sins, you can be saved. And that's literally what the church should be doing. Now look around at different churches. Search the internet. Search different churches. What are churches doing today? What is the majority of local churches doing today across the world? Okay, you get the picture, right? Back to their reading. Then they replied. They replied. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. See, this is the reason why many salvation that people say they're saved, they're really not. Because they don't, they, number one, they, they, they refuse to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. See, they want a honeycomb ice cream cake and ice cream, good luck, 
fairy tale, pleasant happiness, but they don't want the Lord Jesus. See, that's what the preaching of the gospel brings. It introduces you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, Savior, Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. When a man preaches the Word of God in its fullness and its accuracy, the Holy Spirit uses that message to bring conviction of sin, conviction of judgment, and conviction of righteousness. The sinner reaches out to with his repentiveness and calls on the name of the Lord to be saved. Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. This salvation, Paul was telling him, is not only for you, but for you and your household to receive. So they spoke the word of God to him and to all others in his house. It's amazing. It's amazing. That the salvation of God reaches beyond an individual. It reaches even into a person's household. Household meaning children. Household meaning servants. Household meaning all that is in the house. His family. His servants. They receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the church did a turnabout and start dealing the mission of the church to witness and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they, this is what's happening now. So they, they spoke the word of the Lord to this jailer and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. And then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul said. You have to believe in God. So why did Luke express Verse 31, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then at the end of verse 35, he believed in God. Let's go back to the book of Acts, the book of John, excuse me, to verify this. In John's Gospel, in John's Gospel, chapter 20, and we, I'm, I'm searching to make sure that I have the right and correct scriptures. All right, yes, I do. In John's Gospel, chapter 20, starting at verse, where is that, 30? There it is. It says, Jesus, Paul, is the, 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 the Gospel, John is the writer here. Jesus performed many other signs. That's John's Gospel, chapter 20, verse 30. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this epistle, this letter, this book. But these that are written, see all what is written from 1 John chapter 1 up unto what we call the 20th first chapter. All what Jesus did. See, John's gospel uh, records his ministry in Perea. Jesus had a, a ministry in Judea. He had a ministry in Galilee. John records his ministry and his work in the, almost in a in, in sort of the beginning and middle and the ending of his ministry, Jesus' ministry. There were many, many, I mean, there were so many things Jesus preached and did and performed. John says, but these that are written in this gospel of John, that you might believe, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. 
I imagine, in my own imagination, I'm thinking that it's quite possible that the church is reach a stagnant and a boring situation that they say, why do we all the time have to talk about Jesus? Let's stir up, a, let's get some fun and excitement in it. Let's start doing things, moving around, shaking it up a little bit. And that's exactly what the church has done. And by doing this, they vacated the message of the gospel. They have vacated the death and burial and resurrection, the ministry of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. They have ignored the ministry of Jesus as being the Son of God. When you ignore that, you're showboating. You're there as a figure, as a symbol, but you're there, not there doing the work of God. These things were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Now all you have to do is go through the ministry of Jesus and what he preached, what he did. And you will see that in everything Jesus preached, everything Jesus ministered, it pointed to him as being the Messiah. The climax of it was that he died on the cross, Isaiah 53, Psalms 22. The prophets spoke of his coming, his incarnation, his virgin birth. It spoke of his suffering. It spoke of the Messiah dying for sin. It spoke of the Messiah being buried. It spoke of the Messiah being risen from the dead. It spoke of the Messiah coming back again. The church left that message because if that message was the dominant message of the church today, we will have a whole lot of people being drawn by the Spirit of God and there will be true salvation in the hearts of many people. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 13, verse 24, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seeds in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, or tares among the wheat, and went away. And when the wheat sprout and form heads, then the terrors also appear. The owner noticed this, and he came to the, the man who sowed good seed. He said, Sir, did not you sow good seed in your field? Where then these terrors, weeds, come from? The good man said, The enemy did this. Verse 28, the servant replied and said, do you want us to go and pull them up? The, the master said, the, the good man, he says, verse 29, no, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you know, you're uprooting the weeds, you know, you, you may be uprooting also the wheat. Leave them alone. Let both grow together unto harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. What does Jesus say? Before Jesus descends from the heavens with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, the church the local church is going to be in a predicament as we are in right now. Vacating the mission, ignoring the salvation of people, ignoring the homeless, the fatherless, and the widows. The church is not doing that. They're ignoring. It's property 
is gain, prosperity, glorification, selfishness, and greed is maintaining the church today. You cannot say, oh no, that's not true. Well, look at the church. Is the gospel message repeatedly being preached and preached and preached to the congregation, to the people, for the salvation of their selves or and the discipleship of training and teaching and instructing the believers in Christ? No, the enemy has crept in the church. As Jesus says, the enemy did this. He has risen up, risen up church folk, church goers, well esteemed men and women equipped from the seminar, from the colleges, Bible colleges, Bible seminars, universities to start these various ministries, and not only that avenue, they have taken courses and certification in motivating speaking, coaching, directing people, inspiration as far as building churches, building, growing your ministries, all that has crept into the church. The gospel is just put aside. We don't need it. Well, every now and then we'll mention it, but that's not our main focus right now. But not so with the mission of the early church. Back to the book of Acts. This guy believed in God. He believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent officers, this is Acts Chapter 16, verse 35. The magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrate has ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you, may, you can leave and go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Romans, citizens. And threw us into the prison. Now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrate. And when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. See, you, you were, you, it's, it's against Roman law to flog, to discipline, to correct in open public or even in secrecy a Roman citizen. But they didn't. They flogged them. Verse 23. And threw them into jail. So they came. The officers, uh, they came to please them and escorted Paul and Silas from the prison requesting that they leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. Chapter 17, when Paul and his companion had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonian, they came to Thessalonica. There was a Jewish synagogue there. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue on three Sabbath days, and he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that Jesus had to suffer and rise from the dead. Let's, 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 let's look at that. In many of the district places within the countries, as far as the area, like Amphipolis and Apollonia and, and Thessalonian, Corinth, Galatia, different areas, right? They had synagogues, Jewish synagogues. These Jews, they met on Saturday. They, some of them still refused to receive Jesus as the Messiah. Just like in your locale, where you at right now, there, there's certain areas where Jews meet and even live, work, and everything, do their shopping. And they refuse to go into a Gentile church, a Gentile structure of any sort. They wait till the Sabbath day. They still hold the Sabbath day. 
even customary today. But in Paul's day, it was still the Sabbath for them, and they met to get together. So in order to witness to the Jews, you got to go where the Jews at. You had to go into the synagogue, and that's exactly what Paul. So three Sabbaths, Paul reasoned from the scriptures. What scriptures? The Old Testament scriptures. See, in the synagogue, they had the Septuagint, which is the Greek uh, Old Testament, written in Greek. It's called the Septuagint. The word sept is the word sept, seventy, the writings of the seventy. So, therefore, while they was in the Babylonian captivity, they, you know, revised the Old Testament scriptures, translated into Greek. Now, the scriptures... As far as Genesis, the five books of Moses, the prophetic writings, the Psalms, and the prophets. All right? The writings, the prophets, the Psalms, and the, and, and the five books of Moses. Those were the sections that Jesus even identified in Luke chapter 24. But you see, the Jews were blind because they were still waiting for the Messiah. They, 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 they never knew that the Messiah had came years earlier and died, buried, and rose again. So Paul went to the Old Testament writings, the Old Testament writings, and pulled up Michael, you know, Michael chapter 5, Bethlehem of Judea, he that the governor shall come out of you, and, okay, he pulled up Isaiah chapter 6. Right, chapter 9, chapter 7, he pulled up 714, Isaiah 714, a virgin, okay? He pulled up Isaiah 9, unto us a child is born. He pulled up the Psalms, the various Psalms. He pulled up Genesis 315 and started talking about the seed of the woman. He, he pulled up these scriptures and they were amazed that Paul proved that Jesus is the Messiah. Because everything he did pointed to the Old Testament, the miracles that he performed, his life. Paul says, this Jesus, Yeshua, Yeshua, I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. See, the Jews at that time, in those days, were persuaded by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and the magistrates. They, 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 they refused to receive Jesus. Now, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea and certain well-off and, 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 and people, they realized that Jesus was an extraordinary man to the point that even Nicodemus, Joseph, Alimathea, and many of the wealthy ones received this Jesus. They received him as the Messiah. See, Paul was in the synagogue proving through the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah that has suffered and risen from the dead. The psalm spoke of, spoke of it. The Old Testament scriptures spoke of the Messiah being suffered, got put to death, and rising again. Some of the Jews, verse 4, were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks, and quite a few prominent women. So you see that the, 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 the people were gathering around, and they realized that this Jesus whom they or either their generation before them, or not their generation, but the years earlier, their relatives, had called out, we want Barabbas instead of Jesus. See, all this was coming to their minds, and they, they repented and trust the gospel message that Paul and Silas were speaking of towards Jesus. But it didn't stop there now, because once again, persecution rose up because verse 5 says but other Jews were jealous so they round up some bad characters from the marketplace 
and formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the believers before the city council, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defiling Caesar's decree, saying there is another, G another king, one called Jesus. And when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials they were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and others post bond, and then they let them go. See, they was still hunting for Paul and Silas. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Now we're going to pick up that next uh, Sunday, Lord's will, and see what happened in the district of Berea to the Bereans when they heard the truth. See, in Thessalonica, they grasped hold the truth in the Jewish synagogue and received Jesus as the Messiah who suffered and died and risen again. Paul had to go through the Old Testament prophecies, the scriptures of the Old Testament text, to prove to them that that same Jesus whom you crucified, see, it almost sounds like Acts chapter uh, 2 and 3 with Peter. That same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Let me read that message that Peter uh, spoke to the Jewish, spoke to the crowd. Okay? Peter. Okay? okay. It was the day of Pentecost I won. Okay? men of Israel, that's Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you. See, this is the same thing that Paul reached out and showed through the Old Testament scriptures what Jesus did. Peter already is using a familiar same message. He's saying he did miracles, signs, and wonders, which God did by him. Isn't it amazing how these so-called ministries and churches and preachers are trying to do the same miracles, signs, and wonders? See, see, they think they need that in order for people to believe them. They, they think they need miracles, wonders, and signs. See, when you do miracle signs and wonders, people is going to say, hey, God must be with you. But that was then. We're called to preach the word. Preach the word. That's what Paul said. Preach the word. Not perform miracle signs and wonders. We're not to duplicate and try and do what Jesus did because we can't. We're not little Jesuses. We're not Jesus. But the ministries, the majority of ministries is based on miracles, signs, and wonders, and prophetic sayings, prophetic utterances, prophesizing and preaching without the scriptures, adding to what the scriptures already recorded. This is what they're doing. Every time they prophesy that God told me to tell you this, God says this, I'm telling you the world is coming to an end, and they're adding to the scriptures. But notice what Peter says. Which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye also yourselves know, being determined by the, being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. See, these same people in this synagogue, in Acts chapter 17, in this Jewish synagogue, some of them may have been there and witnessed that Barabbas scene. They may have witnessed the, the, the beating of Jesus 
and Jesus standing on one side of Pontius Pilate and Barabbas on the other side. They may have been there. If not, they heard. Everybody in the Roman Empire heard about this man, Jesus of Nazareth. So Paul says, this, this Jesus, whom I'm preaching to you, the Old Testament scriptures, speaks of him. Notice how Peter, in the book of Acts chapter 2, is, 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 is really laying it out to them. Notice what he says, Acts 2, 24. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible for him, for he should be holding of it. For David speaks concerning him. See that? I foresaw the Lord always before my face. This is Psalms 110. For he is my right hand and that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou will not leave thy holy one. Leave me in the grave, neither will you suffer the Holy One to see corruption. You see how David prophesies <clears throat> the burial of Jesus in the grave, and he stayed there for three days? See, beginning at the fourth or fifth or sixth day, corruption deterioration was beginning to hit the human body in the grave. So on that third day, it was so important that the third day he rise from the dead. Wow. Paul, I mean Peter, began to say in verse 29, Men and brethren, let me speak freely of the patriot David, that he is both dead and buried and his life, it says here, his life, let me read, let me, excuse me, I have some writings over there. That's verse 29. Let me read it in, in the translation here. Verse 29. He said, I tell you confident that the patriot David dead and was buried and his tomb is still here to this day. The word sepulcher here in the scriptures here my Writing, I got to scratch and say grave, okay. But anyway, his grave is with us this day. Therefore, being a prophet, talking about David, knowing that God had sworn by an oath to him that of his own loins, according to the flesh, he would rise up Christ to sit on the throne. Seeing he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of the Messiah, Jesus, that he was not left in the grave, neither his flesh did see corruption. I know in your King James you're reading hell. I, yeah, you're reading hell, but it's the grave. This Jesus had God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted and had received from of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has shed forth this. For David is not ascended into heaven, but he said, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So that's another psalm David is, is uh, as Peter is quoting. See, you have to read out the scriptures. Stay in the scriptures, read out the scriptures, whether it's old or new. The power of the Holy Spirit will use the scriptures to convict men of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. A person being convicted by the Holy Spirit of God will see their lost condition as being wretched and lost without Christ, 
They will cry out through repentance and faith in Christ and truly be saved. And, and that's what the church should be doing. And if we preach the gospel in its accuracy, in its, in its truthfulness, according to the scriptures, people will be saved. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the word of God. Would to God, would to God, would to God that the church everywhere that whatever name they call themselves on the front of their door, in the lawn, on the house, on the building, will respond by proving that they are an assembly, a congregation, a church, by continuously preaching the gospel, the gospel, the gospel message. That individuals may hear the truthfulness of the gospel and be saved. That Christian folks will be strengthened through the preaching of the gospel. Will be taught how to witness to people about the gospel. That elders will shepherd the flock accordingly as pastors. And we will see a surge of people coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior. We thank you. Blessed is thy name, O Lord, we pray.